thank you all for coming today. Welcome to the opening of the 42nd Annual Conference on DC Historical Studies. Without further ado, I want to introduce Jane Cordell Levy, who is chair of the committee that prepared this conference. About 12 months in the making. Jane. Good morning, DC History. Yay! Welcome. John, thank you for once again hosting the conference here at the Historical Society of Washington, DC. Um, as uh, most of you know, this conference was started in 1974 as a collaboration between the Historical Society, George Washington University, and the DC Public Library with the University of Maryland's Jim Flack, who is back here. Jim, let's show you who you are. Jim Flack was on the original organizing group that created this conference. And Jim, we thank you every year, and we thank you again this year. Um, I am delighted to be the chair this year of the Historical Studies Conference, uh, working with a terrific committee, uh, who, most of whom are here in the audience, and so I'm gonna ask committee members to stand up and be recognized, please. I know you're feeling shy. Come on, John, everybody up. Everybody up. Thank you. As John Swow said, it's been a year of, of work and planning, and of course, uh, we are doing this, filling the shoes of the last year's chair, who, Matthew Gilmore, who was actually the chair for a number of years and, and brought a number of innovations to the conference. So uh, I want to recognize Matthew's uh, role in all of this, and here we are with more innovations this year, as you can see, beginning with the program, uh, of which we are inordinately proud. Uh, you will notice in your program this year that not only do we have the descriptions of the, of the panels, but we tell you what room they're in. <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> we gave you about 20 pages in the back of the book to take notes on, so that instead of scribbling on one sheet of paper the way I did for the last 20 years of this conference, you can actually take some notes that make sense to you the next day. Um, anyway, we, we, we hope that the program works for everybody um, and that it's one of, as I said, of a number of innovations that you'll see in the conference over the next two days. Um, so I'm going to do a little housekeeping, and then I'll be opening the uh, Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Lecture. Uh, more housekeeping here. First of all, also in the house, is Chris Myers-Ash. Chris, where did you hide yourself? Please stand up. Chris Myers-Ash is the editor of Washington <coughs> History Magazine. Everybody in this room needs to write for Washington History Magazine. It's just that simple. Chris is the man to talk to. He'll be at the History Network at, at uh, lunchtime today, and he'll be around the conference to talk to you about your ideas and how you can submit something to the journal. It is a peer-reviewed journal, but we also have certain sections in there that are meant to be written by people who are not necessarily the serious scholars with the footnotes. So take a look at Washington history while you're here and see if there's something you can contribute. Um, also, at, uh, you should have been given when you checked in a survey about the conference. Did you all get that piece of paper? Okay, you will be getting it at some point during the day. We have just one page, and we would be very pleased if you would fill it out. And as you leave the conference at the end of, of tomorrow or whenever it is is your last moment here, if you would turn that in to us so we can get a little bit of feedback on how we're doing and things that you'd like to see next year. Conference this year is on three levels. Um, we are in the main level, which is the middle of the three levels. Also on this level out in the lobby is one of our innovations. It's, being, it's called Clio's Lounge. Clio being the muse of history, history right. And uh, it's a, meant to be a gathering place so that when you come out of a session and you've got, you're all excited about the topic and you want to keep on with the discussion, we invite you to come down to Clio's Lounge. It's a glass booth. So it's kind of an enclosed space where you can talk without disturbing the other sessions that might be going on. That's the idea behind it. There's also room to hang out on the lower level, which is called the Banneker Gallery. Um, so those, that's it for my uh, housekeeping. And now I'm going to open the Letitia Woods Brown lecture was a, a key, key person in, in the study of DC history. Um, I'm going to just tell you that I missed meeting her when I got to GW, um, but her, her work and uh, her view of the world was evident everywhere that I went in doing DC history at GW. So like all of us who do DC history, uh, I owe her a great debt of gratitude she really expanded the scope of DC history uh, in the work she did at GW and making it inclusive in a way that it just had not been up to that time. 
Um, I also want to say that when I was at GW, and this is not meant to be about me, um, I was fortunate to encounter Elizabeth Clark Lewis, our speaker, for the first time, where she was uh, adjuncting, right? Is that what it was? Banneker <laughs> Professor, excuse me, I always get that wrong. She had a fellowship, a named professor fellowship, the Banneker Professor, and she was there when I was a student, and she seemed to be so much older than me at that point, but now I've discovered it was really only like a couple of years. It's just she was so much more accomplished. Um, so uh, I'm pleased that we have this connection as well. Um, and now it is uh, my privilege to tell you that in the audience today are members of Letitia Woods Brown's family. And I would like you to stand as I call your name. And I'm saying members of the family. We're talking family <laughs> and friends. So General Rus Russell Davis, who is the nephew of Letitia Woods Brown, if you might would stand, please, and be recognized. <laughs> and with him is Shirley Davis. <laughs> Uh, friend Lois Dyer, are you here, Lois Dyer? No, she's late. Okay, Dwight Franklin. That's my son. I know. I know. Dwight Franklin, <laughs> and Shelley, who's with Dwight Franklin, right? Uh, Nadine Robinson. No, not here yet. Uh, Jackie Trescott, I know you're here. If you could stand and be recognized. Donald Murray, who is son-in-law of Letitia Woods Brown, is here in the front row. And last but certainly not least, Lucy Brown. Mary Lucy, come on up. Lucy Brown Murray is the daughter of Letitia Woods Brown, and she has been a tremendous support for this uh, lecture ever since it was begun as a memorial in 1976. And I'm going to make the announcement that this year we are very gratified and pleased to tell you that Lucy Brown Murray has made a donation of a thousand dollars towards the honorarium for the speaker. <laughs> we are inspired by this gesture and we hope you will all be similarly inspired. <laughs> Lucy, would you like to say a few words? Just, just uh, I, I am very thrilled of course to be here and I'm ecstatic that the topic is on my mom. This would have been her 100th birthday, you know, had she lived um, and all. So I just can't think it's more pleasing. And, and I'm like, I'm not, I, I'm broke, but I'm not as broke as I could have been or was when we were putting kids through college. So from now on, we want to be able to support the, this lecture, but especially Dr. Lewis and, of course, with this topic. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I think my mother would, is probably beaming that it is still going on after all these years. Um, and it's just from the determination of a lot of good people that understand the importance of DC history. And for us, the, um, you know, as African Americans, as we are just, we love DC and we love the role that African Americans have played in the role of DC. So that's one reason, another reason why we, I'm gonna make the commitment to help fund this lecture. So thanks very much. <laughs> So at this juncture, uh, I just want to ask, how many of you have not been to the Historical Studies Conference before today? Okay. Well, I want to tell you something which is important, and that is I want to welcome you to the family. The Historical Studies Conference is a family affair. Like most families, we don't always get along. Sometimes we have disagreements. Um, but we do have at the bedrock a passion for DC history, and a respect for everybody who is engaged in this really, really important topic. Um, as I, I often think of, of DC history, I think of a quote, which is actually a paraphrase from Longfellow, uh, which is that, which is to say that my enemy is somebody whose stories I don't know. And this historical studies conference is dedicated to making sure we know each other's stories. And by that, we have a better city and a better community. All right, at this juncture, I'm going to introduce um, the introducer. <laughs> Dr. Ida Jones, who will be introducing our speaker, uh, is a member of the Historical Studies Conference Committee, a very hardworking member, I should say, um, who you will see around the conference uh, the next couple of days doing a lot of different roles. Um, 
Ida was born and raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She has three degrees from Howard University, including the PhD in American History, and she is an independent scholar. Her publications are uh, The Heart of the Race, The Life, I'm sorry, The Heart of the Race Problem, The Life of Kelly Miller, and also her most recent book is Mary McLeod Bethune in Washington, D.C., Educator and Activism in Logan Circle. You may also know Ida from C-SPAN, where she has moderated discussions on women's suffrage. Uh, and so I'm going to end my introduction with a quote from Ida, uh, which is a quote from Mary McLeod Bethune. Ida believes deeply in the words of Mrs. Bethune, who wrote, quote, power must walk hand in hand with humility, and the intellect must have a soul. Ida Jones. Good morning, and thank you, Jane, for that introduction. I just want to add a few tidbits, since we've had some stragglers come in. Um, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Uh, Murray's son has arrived, so Dwight, can you please stand? This is his grandson of uh, Letitia Woods Brown. He looks just like his mom. And I also want to introduce Dr. Betty Gardner, who was one of her first doctoral students at GW, who is here in the lovely red blazer. If you Betty, can you just wave your hand here? And, and she's one of two Bettys. The other Betty is in Pennsylvania, but there were two Bettys, and Lucy knows all about that. So it's very fascinating to hear about people's poor history. Yes, stories. But once again, welcome and good morning. I'm here to give an introduction to a friend, a scholar, and a mentor, Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis. It says on her university page, a historian of the United States experience, she has taught courses in African American women's history, women in the United States, African American history, the history of the District of Columbia, and the history of African Americans in Pennsylvania from where she hails, Harrisburg. If you know her, you know she's from Harrisburg, very proudly. As the director of the public history program, she has offered courses in museums, archives, oral history, historic preservation, and field studies. She has birthed generations of students that have come and done great work in public history with the National Park Service, the Smithsonian, and those of you who are contemporary students, please feel free to reach out to those of us who are former students to probably get a paid internship or a job, because she always believes in you getting paid. So I know you're getting a grade for being here, so I know you're getting paid on some level. <laughs> There's some exchange going on. Um, nevertheless, in conjunction, she has taught students about genealogical research, which is a dear passion of hers, family history, and courses related on those themes. Sometimes we don't know the strength of our own families because we always look to great history from top down, when we should be looking left to right, and as a result, find those heroes and heroines in our own bloodline who have done amazing things, even just maintaining one's sanity during the course of the 20th century <laughs> in America. Professor Clark Lewis was also the project director and producer for the PBS documentary film, Freedom Bags, which won the Oscar Micheaux Award. Her work has been supported by numerous grants from the National Park Service, the National Endowment of the Arts, the DC Arts and Humanities Council, and several private corporations. If you have a chance to look at Freedom Bags, that shows you her dedication to the oral history and the lateral looking of history in her own family. Those women who worked as domestic workers and doing rad radical things, sacrificing themselves to bring income into their families and building great legacy on that. And it's an amazing film to look at. She was also on the board, executive board, of the Organization of American Historians. And on that page, she says her personal statement, I feel that researching, writing, and teaching of history are central to the development of new, individual, national, and global paradigms for the future. For these reasons, research, reform, and action have been the nexus of my history activities. Engendering new interpretations of documents, giving common assumptions fresh perspective, and recovering lost voices from the past are attributed to my investigations. My publications reflect the history field's complexity and my personal fealty to inclusively reflect the diverse impact individuals, policies, events, tenets, and traditions have had on contemporary studies of the past. This is almost mirroring the actual work of Letitia Woods Brown in regards to her idea of using history as a tool to empower, to expose, to inform, and to enlighten. So it's with those humble words I bring before you Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis to bring those for centennial reflection. Good morning. Good morning. Rarely will I read a paper, but this occasion requires that I read a paper and do it well. I would like to thank the Historical Society of the District of Columbia and its program committee for extending to me the invitation to speak 
at the Letitia Woods Brown Lecture during the celebration which commemorates her birth 100 years ago in 1915. I want to thank the Howard University students, graduate and undergraduates who are here. Can I ask you to please stand? I'd like to thank my faculty colleagues, two of which who said they won't stand. And I'd like to thank my faculty colleagues, past and present, for coming. Please stand. Great. I'd like to also, and when you have written information, you go from it. <laughs> I'd like to thank Dr. Betty Gardner, who's one, who was one of two of the students who completed their PhD under Dr. Letitia Brown. She was a wealth of information, and I want to publicly again thank her for all her help in this and about 200 other projects <laughs> that she has always faithfully helped me on. Dr. Gardner, thank you. A special thanks goes to my friends, family members, and others who are here. Um, and all of you who know me know that I'm extremely proud, as Dr. Woods Brown was, as a mother. Uh, one of my daughters had a teacher conference, and I told her, go to the conference. Dr. Abner Lewis Moon is on the faculty at Coppin State University. My other daughter is here, Dr. Bola Ayodeji, please stand. Many of you know she is a physician here in Washington, and most recently a doctor who's worked with Health and Human Services. That's right, my husband and I, two people who never thought we'd get through teenage years, <laughs> have two doctors that we are so very proud of. Speaking of my husband, he made it clear he did not want me to recognize him and ask him to stand. <laughs> but the gentleman who was in the blue jacket, <laughs> With the dreadlocks to his waist <laughs> is my wonderful husband, who of 45 years has put up with me and my ridiculous um, projects, from talks to movies to anything else I seem to find to do. And he's always patient and very supportive, and the best dad anyone could have had. With scholarship, it is important to remember that people writing history decide their interests from a broad range of subject matter. Then they choose one subject they feel is most important, access the evidence that sustains their historical principles, and finally, they transform their detailed investigations seamlessly into scholarly books, narratives, museum exhibits, and presentations to people in the general public with an interest in their topic. For full disclosure principles and transparencies, I must state that as a public historian, I absolutely <coughs> include histories that are heard like oral histories or experienced like museum exhibits in my <coughs> definition of scholarly works. In history, the aims and, ex and experiences of individuals seeking new freedoms and creating new lives are far-reaching and engaging themes for researchers. Investigating people seeking new freedoms and creating new lives forces historians to update key questions and rethink definitions, not only in existential terms, but also in disciplinary terms. New freedoms and new lives, for historians in particular, create exciting collisions of the past that are overlapping without ever fusing. From griots in ancient Africa, the oral histories that became the basis for ancient Greek scholars like Thucydides and Cato, the Roman historian, to contemporary scholars such as Jelani Cobb, Tanahasi Coates, Kendrick Lamar, J. Cole, and Jay-Z. These persons are creating histories which fill in the cracks between large historical events 
and depict the intricacies of daily life. In the scholarship of W.E.B. Du Bois, The Negro in the South, Dr. John Hope Franklin, and this is also his centennial year, Dr. John Hope Franklin, The Negro in North Carolina, 1790 to 1860, Lorenzo Green, The Negro in New England, 1620 to 1776, Benjamin Quarles, The Negro in the American Revolution and The Negro in the Civil War, and too many others to name. These are all contemporaries of Dr. Letitia Woods Brown, who was the author of The Free Negro in the District of Columbia, District of Columbia, 1790 to 1846. <coughs> From these works, the past resonates with immediacy, power, and decisive actions that shed light on national <coughs> problems and guarantee these topics will never be monographs created in isolation or a succession of lone studies or chronicles about a people who have no history. In fact, these works confirm that when history is denied, that is when history is most unmistakably at work. The historical scholarship of Dr. Letitia Woods Brown reflects a rare scholar who wrote books while always balancing her respect for the subject with the needs of the community of which she was a part. With pride, she researched, wrote, and taught Washington, D.C. history. Her investigations were never a linear succession of unrelated facts because she understood that history was not a, se was not a sequence but a constellation of forces, a process of placing events in relation to each other and the point of contact between structure and event, between generality and particularity. Barbara Tuckman was one of the United States' most popular historians in the 1960s and 1970s, believed that academic historians had too many captive audiences. First, with the dissertation advisor, <laughs> then with their students in lecture halls. She often stated, historians did not really know how to capture and hold the interest of an audience. Clearly, she never met Letitia Woods Brown. For example, Dr. Brown walked into a special seminar filled with militant Howard University students who were directing venom at the old ways of history. After her lecture, students in that room could not ignore the considerable evidence she unapologetically kept before us. I mean them. <laughs> African Americans like Amelia Hill, Mariah Jones, or Andrew Miles were examples of newly freed persons who wanted equality and opportunity rather than revenge on those who enslaved them. African-American school teachers like Ms. Mrs. Anna Maria Hall, grocers like Joseph Moore, and a doctor like Mr. James Fleet knew the visceral dread whites had when in a community with a resistive African-American majority. With empirical data, Dr. Brown's students learned why African-Americans wanted to live as U.S. citizens rather than murder their oppressors, period. And when she was done, everyone was quiet. To make these points, Dr. Brown was a scholar who willingly embraced the use of three types of materials. First, physical artifacts. Secondly, private family documents. And third, official records of the city of Washington, D.C. as it evolved. Scholars respect how she could take an object like a waiter's artifact used by the 19th century caterer, Henry Orr, and show it was not silent. Objects speak in loud voices and help us transcend from viewing something material from the past 
to grasping the meaning <coughs> of this thing, valuing how its owners used it and appreciating the importance the owner attached to the object. With expertise, she used private family documents to reveal the inner relationships between different members of the District of Columbia community. <coughs> for me, I had an insatiable appetite for researching the lives of servants. I constantly focused on the inequities African American servants faced. White, whites got this. White servants got that. On and on and on. Dr. Letitia Brown was one of the first professors who insisted that I stop worrying about them and fine tune my research on African American servants, forms of servitude, records, performances, and lives in general. The third type of evidence, official records of the city of the District of Columbia that she highlighted, and I ask you to note, these were records that were created even before the District of Columbia was created, and of course, before it was the nation's capital. The record she used, that she selected, had a heavy emphasis on interpreting many practical matters and the complexities of traveling the path between enslavement and freedom. <coughs> For example, in the book Washington, From Banneker to Douglas, the grievances of African Americans after the Civil War were not doleful tales of missed opportunities and suppressed possibilities. They focused on the cohesive and ambitious push for education, judicial redress for past legal imbalances, and improving self-provisioning opportunities at the community level. Trailblazing scholars examining new freedoms and new lives must also understand they can never be allowed to retreat behind university walls that harbor and feed them and consequently subdue their ability to hear community voices. As intellectuals, local and public historians especially cannot shirk their responsibilities by falling into Persean retreats with circular memories. For example, we must willingly raise questions about what is and who really made Washington, D.C. history. Generations of African-American historians, to name just one group of articulate social critics, have refocused scholarly, scholarly debates to reveal how African-Americans without civil rights equality could and did create individually rich lives and community-based liberties. Dr. Brown was a scholar who never wanted to have African Americans or their community viewed as people living dismal lives that passively accepted legal or de facto segregation. Scholarly studies by this generation of historians always by example and by inference, fostered wide-ranging insight about the social, economic, and political activism that foreshadowed the return of civil liberties deprived after the Civil War and Reconstruction era. When we think of leadership, the nature and dimensions of the myriad problems addressed by great leaders are the core <coughs> of many books. From John D. Moses' work on leadership in 17th century North America to Fannie Lee Hamer's enumerations on leadership in a 1967 biography to Praise Our Bridges, as well as a new book by Mary Frances Berry, Five Dollars and a Pork Chop Sandwich, <laughs> Vote Buying and the Corruption of Democracy. Leadership is defined as much more than a person who guides and directs a group. An award-winning book on leadership, In Troop and in Truth, says leadership is about 
the ability to listen, to inspire, to empower others, to be bold enough to have a vision and humble enough to recognize achieving it will take the efforts of many people to have the clarity to show, to have the clarity to know the right things to do and the courage to do the right things even when they are hard. Scholars use a plethora of astonishing sources to construct pioneering works which provide insight into the complex connections and interactions between people and great leaders. For me, leadership was a deeply personal experience and it had a deeply personal vein. Walking up Pennsylvania Avenue from the National Archives with Dr. Letitia Brown, I voiced my struggles and the issues facing young historians imbued with a desire to foster professional respect and new paradigms for histories of persons like me, descendants from individuals who had been enslaved. In a National Archives three-week intensive genealogical institute with the top family historians from all over the world, Dr. Brown had been responsible for the segment on oral history. While walking with her to lunch, I tried to recount the three of us who were doing African Americans, and I tried to explain to her, at the Institute, we were constantly meeting genealogists who were unduly skeptical about data from people who lived with and were able to document and talk about the experience they knew their family members had had as enslaved people. I had done ex extensive research on an enslaved man, his 33 children, and even discovered his mother. But genealogist after genealogist could not accept this version of family history. Their intelligent conclusions about my family history required an examination and comparison of evidence from their own perceived credible, authentic written sources found in manuscripts, books, or published articles. If you know Dr. Brown, rapidly she explained to me why local history was a noble segment of the historian's profession and one of, one of unequaled importance for this time of individuals and during this era who are writing history. After the theoretical constructs were quickly outlined, then with peerless directness, and if you've ever seen Dr. Brown look at you through those glasses, <laughs> with peerless directiveness, she spoke to me about the value of my research on the history of this enslaved man, his 33 children, and the unique way I found his mother. With intensity, she told me, one, use all this to significantly contribute to history in the 1970s. For African American historians, genealogical histories have oral sources that are a valid foundation. And finally, she stressed, African Americans must boldly build oral histories into arguments that would change how people could become certified in areas of genealogy that included enslavement. I finally saw how new evidence and or new approaches to old evidence calls into question the received wisdom of the day. Lucidly, I understood that plumet that plum plumeticis, I am so nervous. <laughs> Lucidly, I understood how many individuals posing as historians could be expected to question my family-based interviews and local community-based data. Genealogy and local history encourage new, productive contexts for historical materials by juxtaposing sources within specific new spaces. With clarity, I saw genealogy and local history as the instruments that family histories and family historians would use to clarify factual uncertainties 
and force the genealogical profession to not ignore inconvenient facts. When I first thought about the reality of new freedoms and new lives, this theme, to me, engendered new interior history, the practical, the precise, and the passions of past deeds that will never be written or even suggested. Her words to me that day, in no small way, added to an idea growing within the minds of James Dent Walker, Deborah Newman Ham, Paul Sluby, Marsha Greenlee, Jean Sampson Scott, and Marsha Eisenberg, as well as myself. We, with a new boldness, thoughtfully took her directions and formed the African American Historical and Genealogical Society, the largest genealogical society of its kind in the nation, and they love to say in the world. When we think of incomparable strength, old bifurcations must be rejected. Please remember, at the time of the first census, Maryland and Virginia contained over half of the enslaved population of the entire nation. This proximity informed the laws and practices toward African Americans from the inception of the federal <coughs> district. Earlier studies uncovered the smallest minutia about the past, and when fused together, provided us with grand and sweeping <coughs> interpretations of complex new freedoms and lives as legal, cultural, and historical phenomena. One distinguished scholar wrote, truly great historians are those who, who write purely as historians, have managed to trans transcend the politics of their own age and write faithful narratives of the past, enlisting their pens in the cause of settling some distant dispute. For the District of Columbia, the focus was always on an over-contextualized or downright historicist approach, a belief that, adequate, <coughs> that an adequate understanding of the past requires a complex assessment and viewing the past through the lens of unchangeable cyclical patterns. The analytical, specialized, and often narrowly focused monographs written about Washington, D.C., interpreted the Capitol through the lenses crafted by 18th century state, statesmen who said, and they proclaimed, the dignity and beauty and the ideals of the new republic will be embodied in the stones of Washington, D.C.'s buildings, her parks, and the broad sweeps of her avenue. Dr. Letitia Brown rejected the notion that historians could only use ideas that previous academic historians had established. Find errors in these previous findings and their accepted historiography, and then spend their careers attempting to correct or build upon established ideas, those ideas only. When studies go beyond the established historical dictates, you will have critics. One critic of Dr. Letitia Brown reduced her major work the free Negro in the District of Free Negroes in the District of Columbia to a survey of slaves, slavery and its basic intricacies. While in 1973, a community-based journal dismissed the work altogether as a relic of a person and an era of historians who insist on studying the laws of dead white city founders. You see, these people these post-SNCC loud and serious community leaders had labored to banish that kind of history as irrelevant. The narrative arc in the scholarship of Dr. Brown ties together the words found in legal deeds and petitions which communicate the deep emotions of African Americans who self-assuredly wanted to use any means necessary to move away from bondage the predominantly chronological presentation of the competing notions of freedom persuasively conveys how contested the secondary status was for African Americans. There is a cocoon of dread that you can read in her work when she's explaining how the free population 
have to constantly face, face limited opportunities, annoying red tape, and police, police brutality over the enfor enforcement of the black code. Nevertheless, for a non-enslaved person with all of its problems, life remained biased in favor of freedom. Formerly enslaved persons knew well the stories of people like Anna, an enslaved woman locked up in 1850 in a small dismal, in 1815, in a small dismal attic with her two children. While they awaited being taken to Georgia to be resold, she jumped three stories, shattering her spine because she wanted to return to her husband, her other children, and most of all, not be sold south. Free people in Washington knew the profits of masters and traders came at a high price, a price always paid by the enslaved. In a work co-authored with Elsie Lewis and another book co-authored with Richard Wade, Dr. Brown contextualizes beautifully the conditions under which free African Americans produce their histories and their justification for full citizenship, citizenship rights. In a scholarly tone, she scrutinizes the move from enslavement to freedom while addressing persisting distortions. In 1985, Dr. Nell Irvin Painter was the president of the Association of Black Women Historians. In that year, the Letitia Woods Brown Award for the best book went to Dr. Deborah Gray White, and I won the Letitia Woods Brown Award for the best article. Professor Painter met us in Houston, Texas, <coughs> And before the luncheon, we would receive, and before the luncheon, which is where we would receive the award, she took time to give us both an overview of the ways Dr. Brown's potent advice strengthened young scholars like her in the early 1970s. As a student at Boston University, she had the opportunity to speak with and be mentored by Dr. Brown in person, at conferences or meetings, or by phone, Dr. Brown spoke with young women scholars. She stressed the privileges of whiteness were not going to be extended to African American PhD students, and it would not be shared equally. <coughs> women must do their research, get out of graduate school, and get their ideas published. These were harsh words but they strengthen many women scholars. This is enduring strength. New freedoms, new lives. I feel this conference embodies the life of a respected author, visionary scholar, engaging mentor, rigorous professor, and a woman known to many who are here and remembered by all of us, Dr. Letitia Woods Brown. Happy 100th birthday. There's time for questions. I hope there will. Yes. There's a microphone to your left, so if you make it to the microphone on your left, or maybe since there's not one on the right, play that voice. And the word is polemicist. <laughs> <laughs> I should expect the polemicists not to know. I'm going to walk the microphone around. I'm fine. So I can, for these folks, I think we're taping. So we want to get everybody's comments. Questions? Please. Just turn it on. First of all, thank you very all much. Right. That, I, I learned a lot from you from my grandmother. Thank um, you. She died when I was five. So I, you know, as, I, as, I've gotten, as I've gotten older, I've always wished that she was around because you know, as you grow into an adult, there's a lot more things you're aware of and you think about, 
as it pertains to history, politics, government, and things that are going on, and why we are the way we are, society is the way it is, and I wish he was here so I could talk to her about it. My only question to you at this moment is can I get a copy of your speech because I want my daughter to <laughs> <laughs> I'd be more than welcome. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you Thank you. As a grandmother, and I am the worst grandmother, my, my daughter will tell you they have no sugar, no salt, no fast food. I, I take my Toby, Tony, Tenny, Tony, and Tola. I take them out. I take them to get the fast food. They get, soda, they get candy. And uh, I don't care. Being a grandmother is the best. The best. It makes up for being a parent. <laughs> Thank you. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I'm Kelly Navies. Um, I'm an oral historian, so I was particularly interested in the part where you talked about how she felt about the validity of oral sources. And it has evolved tremendously, the, the perspective towards oral history since that time. And I wanted you to speak as an oral historian yourself on how the field of oral history has evolved from that time to now. Thank you. everything so I write myself notes now. Um, when, when we think of oral history, and please remember when I was doing this institute, I'm not trying to age myself in front of my students, <laughs> but it was 1974, which was before Roots, before the idea, the ridiculous idea that oral history had validity. And um, as I said, I think the field has evolved tremendously beyond what Van Sertema and the other early scholars invoked in terms of theory. Uh, the idea that when you're listening to oral history, you have, and I'm gonna lecture on it, but you have these fixed testimonies versus the other kinds of testimonies and those kinds of theoretical constructs. I think the field has evolved to be more inclusive, that you don't have to have all these cumbersome terms. And in my opinion, um, almost unnecessary training. It is so important to take a tape recorder, pick it up, and record individuals and their experiences. And when possible, I think a visual recording is acceptable. I will use my own experience. Finishing graduate school, I just believed that the experiences of the women that I had talked about who were household workers, who had moved from the rural south, coming north were too important to, re to remain in a book. So I decided I could make a video. I did not know how to make a video. I had no idea what it took. But I decided that I was going to make this video. And I wasn't going to do a regular video. I was going to do a broadcast quality video. I started out begging everybody I knew, every friend, every organization, and writing over 300 grants to get the money, but if you, I was driven. And when I finally got the money, I was able to work through one set of um, filmmakers that didn't work out, thanks to the Humanities Council for backing me up when we had a problem. And I was able to work with a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker, Stanley Nelson, to pull together the history of women who had migrated from the South. And only those words could tell you how women coming from, I'll be specific, my area was 30 miles from success, Virginia. You've never heard of success, so you know how far back in the woods 30 miles was success. <laughs> so if you are getting their story of how they were brought for the first time, something like a train, they saw people getting on, people getting off, they thought this wasn't seriously an animal regurgitating people. They had no idea seriously what this was, or to hear them talk about coming to the first movies in Washington. And you think it's exciting, many of them were afraid because it was so dark and in many ways daunting. Their stories were captured, um, as I said, in this film that I did, uh, Freedom Bags. And something as simple as explaining why at that gen for that generation of women carrying these shopping bags with the best stores names on them. Everyone in here who knows African American household workers in that era carried these bags. And I had to learn from them, for that group of women, that was a badge that they wore and utilized when they moved up, because it showed they weren't living servants, that they got to get up every day, pack this bag, 
with their uniform, travel about the city in their best clothes, <coughs> and these women wore hats and gloves when they moved about the city on what was called streetcars, and get to work, change their clothes, do this work, and then leave that house. And even if they got back to this room or wherever they were staying at 11 or 12 o'clock at night, they were able to leave that job <coughs> and have some sense of self, start churches, kindergartens. They had activities that they deemed as important versus living servants. I had to learn all that from them, and I wanted to make sure it didn't stay in the book. So in doing the movie, in utilizing their oral histories, I think we opened up a whole new area of research and respect, because I know I and many other African Americans in this room came across a bridge of bent backs of women who did that work to make our lives possible today. Any other questions? Please. Yes, I'm Pat Neal, and I just want to know, I might have missed it, where I can get a copy of the book, Free Negroes in the District of Columbia, and to see um, the movie that you made. <laughs> for free copies, for free copies of that book, and it's one of four books. People, I knew, and many of us knew, Dr. Brown and all of the work that she did, but of course she's most famous for the Free Negro in the District of Columbia. And I know all libraries have it. I wish that there was a way that they could approach Oxford for a reissue. And uh, I'm sure her family members know the complexities of getting that important work reissued. It should and really must be reissued because it creates such an important foundation. And it's not, as I said, this overview of slavery. She really linked together the complexities of the people's lives who were free and the interface that they had to help and support the enslaved community in Washington. Can I defer to you on having this book the issue? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what about the movie? Uh, yeah, no, I, um, it, it, to be blunt with you, I, I've had to go like on Amazon. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody's got a used copy, but um, if you, uh, I'm glad to hear that you think it might be worth my trying to push Oxford, you know, it was published by Oxford Press. I don't know if they'll, they'll redo it again, but I think it's, you know, it sounds like if there's interest, well, as a member of the family, I'm willing to push it, so. I would say. Anybody knows? It sounds like an opportunity for a letter writing campaign for everybody here. <laughs> Any more questions for Dr. Clark Lewis? I, I have, okay. Um, Debbie? The question is, where can we see the film? <laughs> Uh, the film is available, I think, still through D.C. Public Library. Um, it is distributed by Filmmakers Library, a company in New York. And as an aside, I'll be speaking next Friday with Soledad O'Brien about making uh, independent film. And I invite you to come to the Warner Brothers Theater at the Smithsonian, and I'll talk more about it. But I'm always happy to, if there's a group that wants to see it, to show up and show the film and then talk about this important era of DC history. Thank you. I'd love to. I'd love to. Love to. Uh, hi, I'm Jane North. Yes, you are. And um, I just wanted to have a personal note, particularly to you, because, uh, and not a question, I studied under uh, Letitia Woods Brown in 1974 at GW, getting my master's in uh, museum education. And it was the first, I had taught American history in Connecticut, but it had never occurred to me to go into local history, and she was such an inspiration. But not only that, I had two teenagers and a younger child still at home. I was 40, and she and I communed on raising children while you're trying to go to school and do it all. And I just can't tell you what uh, an inspiration she was to me and how much I enjoyed her. I, I even was, she had, let me come over to her house at night one time because I was very late in getting some of my research work done, and she was a joy, so thank you. I'm going to quote a story from Betty Gardner, and I am. <laughs> she said without permission. Um, professors often are distracted. And this week, in trying to prepare this paper, I was very distracted. 
And so I had three different graduate students <laughs> coming to bring papers and get papers signed and candidacy work signed at my house. And uh, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Betty Collier Thomas, who were the first two to finish their PhDs with Dr. Brown, talked about coming to the professor's houses and literally sitting on the porch and waiting until they return home. It's not that we didn't love you and we don't love you. It's just that stuff happens. And having spent the time as a Banneker professor at George Washington, which, I mean, it was wonderful to be there and be a chair and have a parking space, you still have a lot of things pulling on your time. And you may say, I'm gonna get there by six, and a meeting may run till seven or eight, and when you get there, the students are waiting, and you're glad to see them. So you just say, oh, hand me that chapter, and thank you so much. But it's, it, is, it is a test. And um, it's not always that we're just these terrible people. It's just that it's a lot happening. And um, I'm just glad to know that someone is organized, focused, always directed, always on point, always correct. <coughs> Dr. Letitia Brown was, in some ways, functioning like I do, doing the best we can, <laughs> trying to keep all these balls in the air. Stand up. Go quickly here. All right, we're gonna, in this just stand. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And I wanted to know a little bit about the life of uh, DC history at GW too, and also at Howard, like some of the institutional the seminars and the groups that were working together, if you could talk a little bit about in the 70s, the university life at all of that. <laughs> I, I'm a professor, so I'm always inspired by other people's institutional work that they do to create DC history and other things like that. I read articles about the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you that there were opportunities for interfacing. I'm, I know that as a student, Dr. Letitia Brown taught at least two seminars at Howard. And I'm not sure how they brought her in. But if I know Lorraine, Dr. Lorraine Anderson Williams, like I know her. She brought in the top scholars. We had um, a seminar with John o. Franklin. Um, I know two seminars with Dr. Letitia Brown. Um, just the top scholars. And the other respect that I have for Dr. Letitia Brown was the way she embraced, and Dr. Um, Lorraine Anderson Williams, the way they embraced various persons who were leaders in our community. And just as we had John Hope Franklin, we also had John Kennard, who had put together the Anacostia Museum. We also had um, many scholars, and I'm drawing a blank. I need help. Black um, Copper, the man who does, oh my goodness. Oh. C.R. Gibbs, please excuse me, it takes a while. <laughs> A person like C.R. Gibbs, who is a historian who's forgotten more history than I'll ever know. We had individuals such as C.R. Gibbs and other community-based historians who came in and gave us lectures and were greatly respected and embraced in that environment. Um, Saunders Redding, and I would defer to Dr. Gardner, was also at George Washington at that time. Isn't that correct? <laughs> You've given a mic. But I think Dr. Saunders Redding was there, and he yeah. also, okay. Um, I thought the question was not only what was done in D.C. history and at Howard, but, but at George GW. Washington. Was that? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, um, let me just say this. Uh, and I don't know who followed, I don't remember who followed Dr. Um, Brown. But at that point in the history department, um, there was only one African-American scholar. 
in the history department. Okay. And so there were a series of people who sort of came and went. Uh, Dr. Redding was, was one of those who preceded um, uh, Dr. Brown, and he was really more um, African American literature than history, but you know, of course it, it worked. Um, so, you know, GW in the 70s was a very different GW to now. Um, I remember meeting. Um, What's his name? Who who does the archives on DC history at GW? Oh. Bernard. Oh, Bernard Demchuk. Yes. Okay. I met him some years ago. Doesn't he do that? I mean, yeah. Okay. All right. At any rate, um, he introduced himself and said he uh, had started the um, collection in African American history. And my comment to him, and I will repeat it, was, well, I'm really happy to hear that. Because when I was at GW, Betty and I were the two African-American students in the history department. And I remember when we first got there, because at that point, uh, there was the consortium, which I guess still does exist, mm -hmm. Howard, et cetera, and so forth. And one of the professors said to us, oh, you, you're at Howard on the consortium. And we said, no, we're at GW <laughs> in the department. <laughs> so a little different, you know, certainly it's grown over time and, and, and I'm very pleased about that. May I just make a comment or ask a question, I suppose. Um, of course, listening to your excellent comments on Dr. Brown and on her work on the Free Negro, um, my uh, dissertation uh, topic uh, was on the free black population in Baltimore in the antebellum period. And you might know or not that Baltimore, unlike uh, the cities you would have thought of, New York and New York and Philadelphia, Baltimore had the largest free black population in the nation <coughs> in the antebellum period. So. Um, when Dr. Brown came to GW, Betty and I were really at the point of doing dissertations. We had done the coursework. So I never really had the opportunity to have a course with her. But because of her work, um, you know, naturally she was the guiding force for me. And I'm just hoping that as um, newer scholars are writing about uh, DC, and the urban experience and so forth, that they really are building on that. I mean, that's, I know there are all kinds of new things going on and technology and all of that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, but I think when you think about looking at, and you mentioned documents and so forth, that you're really building something on these early handwritten documents, if they exist, because many of those don't. So as people are continuing to do things. Hopefully they are also, you know, kind of looking at what the, what the early history was as you talk about today. Because uh, there have been all manner, you know, I know we are now focused on the <coughs> current demographics uh, in Washington, but I think you need to look at something before that. So that's it. I'd also like to add that there were seminars, um, extensive seminars at that point that were so important to African American history studies, culture, et cetera. And frequently, I'm speaking again on the student side, uh, when you would have these lectures with um, peerless scholars like Chancellor Williams, Sterling Brown, you had many students who came from the other schools, particularly African-American students, to hear these scholars because they were not on their campus, uh, whether through the consortium or uh, they just came. Um, today, that's, Howard. that's Howard, of course. At Howard, of course. Um, <laughs> But also today, we still have this, um, I think, very important history, as I said, of embracing uh, young scholars, as I said, like Jelani Cobb, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who are both Howard alum. And we have a brilliant, I, I wish they would follow him around with a tape recorder, Dr. Gregory Carr. If you ever can hear Dr. Greg Carr speak, you will come away a changed person. He is absolutely uh, one to me are the most brilliant people in the world. 
and his work there at Howard is just unbelievable. So I think that when you're talking about how, as faculty, there was interface, there was a great deal of interface with the students, and uh, much of that, uh, I think, enhanced uh, your ability to learn and become a person interested in a particular area of history and scholarship. I just had another question. Um, in terms of today's society with the internet and social media, history is being recorded at a much faster pace than it ever had in, in, uh, in the past, um, and a much more uh, fluid medium than it ever has in history. Uh, how would you, as, as a um, historian, recommend for younger folks in their research to make sure that it's accurate thorough and complete? I think that, and I, again, in transparency, I have to admit that um, technology is so very, very important to me. I was the first professor to teach a class online and then the first for full credit and first to teach grad school and on grad courses online. I love online learning and I love embracing technology. My other daughter is here. Uh, they helped me with my telephone because <laughs> uh, Avenue Lewis Moon, Dr. Moon, Dr. Ayubeji, they come in and they, uh, they go through my phone. They say, give texts. I don't text. Yeah, and so I have to be honest up front. I don't do that well. But I love technology and the way that it can enhance and expand our ability to learn. Um, if I might drop back. At an early period, Jay-Z said that CNN, really, for young people, it's rap music. And you have to be willing to listen and understand, and it can be hard, because they use some language that is tough. But if you can get through it, I just think um, Kendrick Lamar, and I was trying to think of um, just some others that are doing wonderful new ways of history. I think that how we do history has to be understood that the, you don't have to be afraid of the internet because it just gets the material out there quicker. Social media is important because it helps enlist and encourage other people to be involved. The downside of it is, as Dr. Gardner said, there's a reluctance to use the sources, traditional sources. And so as a professor, and my students are here, so they're grudging her, but as a professor, um, you have to figure ways to make the two make some sense. I did a topic that was asking if Abraham Lincoln was facing, they're laughing, if Abraham Lincoln was facing the dilemma of trying to rectify two sides. And I used uh, the issue of cash money, and this is a whole different set of, and the whole issue of what's going on between those persons who are concerned about how you rectify Lil Wayne and his group, which includes Nicki Minaj, which the other individuals who are holding down this company, how do you take the dilemma Abe Lincoln faced in trying to hold this union together with the dilemma being faced by Birdman <laughs> <laughs> and the issues that he's having with his record company. So it is very much that same issue. It's how do you take these competing sides and these competing issues and make them make some sense to students. Now, that probably is a bit out there, but it in fact shows how a leader how is this leader going to hold his company together? And before you dismiss rap, we're talking billions of dollars. And many of these individuals you see, you say, oh, look at them. They're sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars. So is he going to let Drake and Nicki Minaj go just because of his own ego? Or are he and Lil Wayne going to have to figure it out? That's very much what Lincoln had to figure out between General Lee. How do you keep this union together? How do you keep, and let's face it, when we get to the Civil War, a whole lot of money was at stake. 
and power. So you have to be willing to sort of take that or to think that through and see how these issues, which are very different, are still very much the same. And you then translate that to students. Now, you can probably talk to my students in what Jane called this um, hangout, what do you call it, the glass room? The no, Cleo's the, Lounge. Cleo's Lounge. And those of us, we can call it, we can take it over and make it an ebony Cleo Lounge. <laughs> <laughs> but we're good because the muse of history helps us transcend these issues. Okay, I apologize for that. Apologize. Um, I, think, I think at this juncture that the questions uh, have been answered, and I want to, on behalf of the Historical Society and on behalf of the conference, I want to thank Dr. Clark Lewis for her wonderful presentation. We have a lot more conference in store for you, so come on out, check out Cleo's Lounge, and I hear the coffee just arrived in the lobby. I and want to see you outside. I thank all of you. Thank you, thank you for coming. And uh, I wanted everyone. The nation's capital. Uh, this session, and I should note, two of our presenters uh, are on their way. Uh, they'll be.